Hey everyone, we're going to be continuing our conversation from last week, um, really where we were focused on this idea of progressing towards a model where we have not just the training set, which is really foundational to make sure that our model is actually executing the way that we expect, but also moving to the, towards this development set, which is going to allow us to learn and make sure that our model is actually learning something that's reproducible. We might imagine as soon as our data uh, is very well fit to the distribution of the training set that we actually overfit the data and it starts to fail on the development set. And this is the first step for understanding uh, whether or not that process is occurring, right? This is the, the most basic benchmark that you use to make decisions about when you stop training your model and how you interpret how well your model is performing. So let's get started. Really, many things are going to be almost identical uh, from where we were in terms of uh, in terms of last week. We're going to import our same exact libraries as we have them. We're going to have the same variables set up exactly as we have. And now the first difference is in addition to our data, we're going to have a secondary data set, um, which we're calling uh, dev set, data dev. This is the development set that we're going to be using. Um, and it needs to be a little bit different. It can't be drawn from your original uh, data set. It needs to be separate, and your model during training can never have looked at it. So it needs to be a type of holdout set, a holdout set that you will look at during each epoch, but only to evaluate how well your model is training. You will not use it for establishing how well your model will perform on unseen data. You will just use it to understand whether or not you've trained well enough, and you're ready to look at unseen data. That third data set, the holdout set, or the validation set, or the testing set, depending on which language you choose, is the set that you've never used never seen, never touched, and you will use that to make approximations of how well you expect your model will perform on data that you've never seen before. Now, the first, the second major change really is that because we have these new additional data, we do have to go through the same process of bringing in all of the speakers and the vocabulary these speakers use in our original data set, but we also have to extend that to uh, the development set. And this is what's really crucial. We can't just stop with the vocab and the speakers, we have to include the speakers and the vocabulary that occur in the development set. Now, from a scientific perspective, this might seem a little strange in the sense that uh, we're going to look ahead and see people that we've never seen and know the words that they'll be using and who they are. Science-wise, this is a little bit tricky. Um, we have to make the assumption that either we include uh, empty vocabs, words that we haven't yet seen, or that we know that if it's a word outside of the vocabulary that we accept that we're just going to exclude it. These are scientific decisions that depend very much upon the use case and are outside the scope of our discussion. But it's very important from an engineering perspective to note that all of the speakers that occur in your original data, all of the speakers that occur in your development data, and all of the speakers, in fact, that will occur in your testing data need to be known. You need to know all of the words that they're going to use in all three testing sets. Again, this is an opportunity to make mistakes from a science side uh, but from an engineering perspective, that's required. That's a requirement for how we move forward. Oftentimes, they'll use just like empty val values for new language that they haven't yet seen, and they'll map new words to those empty values as they train. Once we've hit that, once we have our the the both the data and the data dev included in our speakers and our vocabulary, we can now just move forward with the word index and the speaker index just as we have before. Our model will be exactly the same. We won't change our embeddings, our, our linear processes. We won't change our forward pass. Everything will remain unchanged. Oops. And then we will move forward to our losses. Now, in our original model, we just had a loss that was related to training. In this case, we also need to have a development loss. Once we have that, that list, we're going to use exactly the same model. We'll take a loss function, our model, and our model optimizer. Again, nothing will change. And now we'll get to the actual heart of the loop of our epochs. Mostly this first step, in fact, all of this first step, all the way through um, what you've seen up until now, will not change. This will be exactly the same. But as soon as we finish this step of go gone through one epoch where we've gone through the entire data set to train our model, we'll then have to start to do something that's a little bit different. And the first thing that we'll do here is that we'll set the model to evaluate mode. And we'll set the torch to no grad. Now, what these do is these allow you to ensure that your model, even though it's being exposed to new data in the dev data set, is not learning. This is crucial. You are not learning from the development data set. You are simply testing on the development data set. This is the equivalent in sklearn of like a dot predict. And in order to get into that mo mode, you have to use this model evaluate and torch dot no grad. Once you're in this space, Almost everything down below will look exactly as it does up above. 
We'll still use the word indices in exactly the same way. We'll iterate through the data set, the uh, data dev in exactly the same way. We'll get our word indices, our speakers, our speaker index. But you'll note the first deviation is that we will not use this model dot no grad, zero grad in, in this particular loop. Because what we will want to do is run our speaker and index through to develop the log probabilities. And if we zeroed out at a gradient, we wouldn't know what those were. We'll get the loss function, which again is the same thing as up above. And now instead of running this loss dot backward, we'll just actually calculate the loss and add it to this total dev loss. So we started a zero index at the top. We're just going to take this loss and add it to that. So we have a running tally of losses in the development set, just as we did up above. And we'll do the same thing on append it. And I've added a little bit more down at the bottom here. This is just to make our life a little bit easier. We're going to print the training loss and the development loss. And I've added this input function. So the model will actually stop training uh, as we go forward uh, and wait for a key press so we can watch it move forward. We're going to do 100 epochs. I'll just bring this up. And once we start, we're on our first epoch. So our model has now run through the entire data training set and it's run through the entire uh, dev set. And what we see is that the training loss is 19 and the development loss is 3.24. And as we continue, we see that our model continues to go down. Our training loss has in fact decreased as is our development loss decreased. And I'll just power through these and you can see as we go that both the training loss continues to decrease and on the right hand side, the development loss steadily decreases as we move through this example. And this is a good reason, a good example of understanding why even if you set everything up the way that you might expect, you in fact, and I'm just gonna let this run, you may still be overfitting your data. The data set that we have, the complexity of the model that we're putting it in front of, it is overfitting. And yet, and yet, given this example, our model continues to have, even to the last step, a training loss that goes down, a development loss that goes down all the way through. So another way to look at this example uh, is just to take these two the loss and the development loss and print them out side by side so you can see what the running tally is. And here you can see that the model continues again to decrease as we move down. And it's not atypical in this situation to plot these as graphs so you can see how the training loss decreases over time and how the development loss decreases. And we'll talk a little bit later in another example of when they cease to follow that model where one decreases and then the second. So this is uh, the the really the heart of what I needed to get through today in terms of uh, introducing this development section. This is very useful. Um, I think it's uh, you know, sound, sort of foundational. We're coming up um, probably on the next step of the, the final piece of what you absolutely have to use in order to have a fully working uh, deep learning model that approximates what you might do in production. And in that case, what we're going to do is you will notice that during this entire time, we've been taking our example uh, through an epoch, but we've been going through our data one row at a time looking at one example. And if you know about batches, you know that this is not optimal. This is in fact not the right way to train a, a real model. However, it's, you know, it's fine for an approximation for this kind of place where we are. The right way to do this is with a data loader and requires a data set. And so what we'll do next is not change the code uh, for execution, but we'll add so that instead of iterating over the speaker sentence and target in these, these triples that come out of data one row at a time, we'll introduce the appropriate way, the, the right way to this, which is to use the data loader function uh, and use an iterator that pulls out a certain number of examples in a batch size. We'll make our model run much more quickly. In fact, um, I tend to write my code this way when I get started and then uh, rip this out and replace it with data loaders, which is not a good practice. Uh, it's definitely something uh, from, you know, it's a holdover from my earlier days of work. But uh, what I find is that when I do rip out that this sort of a model of either using lists or numpy arrays uh, and indexing directly to using a data loader, I see, I've seen a 3x speed up in terms of uh, execution time. So that's non-trivial, really quite crucial. And I'm sure there's some technical people who could uh, dive into exactly what the differences are. At this stage of the game, I'm not super interested. It's probably worth doing a 45 minute discussion just on that later. Uh, I haven't really spent a lot of time paying attention. I, I just know that this is the wrong way of doing it, but it's the clean and easy way to teach. Um, it's a clean and way, easy way for me to think about it when I get started. So I'll start here and then I'll always add in that data loaders as I progress when it's necessary. Have a chance to look at that. Um, think about how you might go about doing that. And we will continue the conversation uh, next week with that example. Thanks.